Well, it's now the 25th of June, 2020. And many are remembering this day as the start of the Korean War. For me, as a veteran of defending Korea during the time of armistice on two occasions, first from 1996 to 98, and then again as the commander of United Nations Command, U.S. Forces Korea and the Korea U.S. Combined Forces Command from 2016 to late 2018, uh, my reflections clearly go back to that day. All that I experienced in those two assignments began with the 25th of June, 1950. You've asked me to reflect on the significance of the Korean War. Uh, we're marking this month, June 25th, uh, 70 years since that terrible day uh, when uh, the act of war uh, began with the crossing of uh, North Korean troops across the 38th parallel. Uh, 70 years is a long time. Uh, I recall from my own uh, childhood growing up in the American West, uh, having uh, uncles and, uh, who had been in Korea. Unlike uh, my father and others who had fought in World War II, they didn't talk very much about Korea. I think there was a sense in the United States that this was the forgotten war, sometimes die for a tie because it ended, it seemed rather unsatisfactorily in a, uh, an armistice, not in a unified Korea or in a, a, a genuine peace and reconciliation. President Truman, who left office before the armistice and of course made the decision to defend the Republic of Korea, called it in his farewell uh, speech, uh, leaving, leaving the White House in 1952, the most important decision of his presidency. And I, I thought that when I first heard that some years ago, and now it's quite extraordinary when you think of the many, many monumental and consequential decisions that President Truman made during his presidency. As I think back, the first thing I recall is that when I arrived in 1996, I learned right away how little I knew about the Korean War. I, I had studied it as a cadet at West Point and studying the history of the military art and we had veterans of the Korean War who were among our instructors, and they did their best to help describe to us the realities of that war. But for many, it was described as the Forgotten War. And I think as a consequence of that, I, like many Americans, didn't know very much about the Korean War. It then encouraged me upon arrival to begin to dig much more deeply and to begin to understand the geopolitical roots of it, it was more than the first hot war of the Cold War. It was really the consequence of a mixture of policy decisions. Among them, the belief that we could quickly reduce our overseas presence, build a constabulary force that eventually would turn into a regular military force, equip it with U.S excess weapons and arms and munitions and reinforce it as necessary with our brand new Air Force and our Navy, and that there wouldn't be a need for ground troops, only an advisory group to be there. Well, that was a policy that was fraught with disaster. And I've been reminded of that many times since then, that that's not enough. That's not the same thing as a shared commitment, sharing hardship, danger, and sharing courage. As June 25th, 1950 showed us, we weren't prepared for what would come. We weren't prepared for that crossing of the administrative line marked on the 38th parallel. We weren't prepared for the North Korean armor that Russia had donated, in many cases left over from World War II, but the forces of South Korea and initially the United States were so thin that they couldn't stop it from advancing. The degree of danger that occurred in those first few months, leading all the way down to what is well known as the Pusan perimeter, and the decisions that had to be made from Japan, where the headquarters was for Far East Command, led by General MacArthur at the time, while building up 
a multinational response while gaining authorities from the United Nations Security Council, a, indeed another fledgling organization. All these things reflect the chaos of the summer of 1950. And to say that there was courage is to fall short in every way of describing the reality of what those who stood the line had to do. On a personal level, um, as a Korean, and as a person born after the start of the Korean War, uh, my early memories of the war growing up in Seoul in the mid 60s uh, were really first hand accounts of the war from my parents and my grandparents, who not only actually went through the war, but also lived under Japanese colonial rule. Um, one thing that strikes me is, as, as I was growing up, I still remember being taught that communist North Koreans, or in uh, a derogatory Korean term, it's called Balgingi, uh, were people whose only objective was unification by force and the utter destruction of South Korea um, as a society. And in, in this respect, I think it's important to now characterize the Korean War for what it actually was. It was, uh, in my mind, from the North Korean view, simply a manifestation of a unification policy. Um, and that unification policy has not um, changed for uh, 70 years. In effect, kind of a war of liberation, a war for unification against a sworn enemy. As we look today and ponder the start of the Korean War 70 years ago, North Korea's view on unification and South Korea has not on a fundamental level changed. I was the third male in, in my family to have served in Korea. Uh, my father's youngest brother, whom I'm named after, fought in the Korean War, but did not make it home alive to live a full life with his family. My mother's oldest brother served in the Air Force shortly after the fighting stopped and made it home to tell me in particular, when I was young, and I don't know why me, um, what Korea was like in the 1950s. But I know from his stories, he thoroughly enjoyed his interaction, I mean, what he had, he was a GI in Korea uh, with the Koreans, and he had a lot of enthusiasm for Korea. And I think that's typical with people who, who have experience living in Korea, that they establish this warm bond with the Koreans. It's hard to explain, but it seems to happen to a lot of people. But I did not serve in the armed forces. I had a completely different experience with Korea. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, and I went to Korea in 1976, a little more than 25 years after uh, the Korean War began. Well, I have to tell you this story. It's not pleasant. So one day we're on a patrol. This is a different time. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of incidents happened with my buddies getting killed or getting hurt. But this was the climax. There was a little, little small little village. I don't know where we were. Small little village. And a lot of uh, South Koreans were assassinated. They might have been in politics. I don't know. But on the side of the road, there were two women that were they were passed away, and three children, two little girls and a little boy. The two little girls were full of blood. They were not hurt. The little boy's hand was blown off. Well, <clears throat> I rushed over and I took my pouch, my medical pouch, and I wrapped his hand. This little boy grabbed my neck and was choking me. He was about five, six years old, little kid. I took his hand and I put him in my pocket. I don't know why I did that, but I did it. So the corpsman came on and over. He looked at it. He says, you got to hold him. He says, he's not bleeding a lot, but you got to hold him. I couldn't, he couldn't let him go. The little girls were fine. So one of the local villagers with their sign language mentioned that certain distance away there was an orphanage and they had a, a minister but he was also a doctor so we put the two girls and the little boy in the jeep okay a medical jeep and we drove there I don't, it was like eternity but this 
driver was San Antonio Hot Rod. So we got there and we went inside, you know, and uh, the little boy would not let me go. We finally got the little boy off my neck and the, 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 the two South Korean women and the doctor put him on the table and he was, I mean, crying, crying to no end. Well, oh, we went back to the Jeep. And while in the Jeep, I said, well, wait a minute. I got the hand in this, my pocket. So I ran back in there and the little boy died. It was too late. He couldn't survive. Well, now I knew why I was there. I finally got the answer that I've been Pressured him so many times. We were there to save these children and these people for the brutality that they're going to have. I do recall arriving in Korea in 1975, so 25 years after that date. And of course, uh, most of the people I interacted with. Uh, had some memories either as children or as combatants, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the war. And I, I, I also recall that they never called it the Korean War. They called it Yu-Gi-Oh! 625. Yu-Gi-Oh! It's one of the first things I learned <laughs> in, in Korean because uh, it wasn't that people talked about it a lot, but clearly it had changed their their lives uh, in the most profound way. So, you know, in, in my time in Korea, that first experience, I mean, it was a time when I, I learned that, first of all, when we talk about the significance of the Korean War, it was significant to, as to what happened to the Korean people, you know, as they moved from hope for liberation in, in 1945, finally, to uh, division and war, and then an, a, a solidified division and armistice uh, in the sense of an unfinished business, unfinished war, which is with us now. So I really had a sense one of the human costs of that war to, to combatants and civilians alike, um, to the many, many divided families. And also, though, to the sense of, of this, this bond that had been forged uh, between, in particular, uh, Koreans and the United States and the importance <laughs> of, of the United States in, in shaping uh, uh, Korea's modern identity and its destiny. And another phrase I learned in Korean at that time was, I, Koreans would say to me, we have a uh, a relationship forged in blood, Kelmengwangge. And that always uh, uh, moved me and, and moves me now, and I think did form the basis for another important significance of the Korean War, and that is the, the relationship between the United States and Korea, and the way that within that context, uh, South Korea, uh, in its own blossoming, and not only its economic development, but also uh, in its, its democratic and social and cultural blossoming and rise to be this admired middle power in the world. I mean, to witness this over the, over, over the decades and to see how it, it came from continued sacrifice and commitment uh, by first and foremost, the people of the Republic of Korea, uh, but with the support and encouragement of, of the United States and providing some security and markets and building the kind of ties that we have today. Uh, it really was quite a remarkable thing to witness over the decades and to think that, no, this was not a die for a tie. This was not without meaning. Uh, that the uh, further investment of, of blood and treasure and commitment that went into building uh, the relationship and building modern South Korea uh, has really, I think, helped to honor uh, the memory of the, the sacrifice of those who uh, endured those terrible days uh, during the Korean War. And those who followed thereafter, from the United Nations sending states over the span of the next two and a half to three years, uh, some arriving as late as 1954, reflected an international commitment to not standing for North Korean and Russian aggression, communist aggression. A line was drawn, and the line had to be drawn several times. I've walked those battlefields. I've, I've walked Chip Young Ni battlefield. I've been to Heartbreak Ridge and Bloody Ridge, places where my units had been in service 
uh, units that I served with through my years. I've been up into the demilitarized zone uh, from west to east into as many positions as I can get just to appreciate not only the nature of the terrain there that I might have to fight in myself if war resumed, but to reflect on what came in the years that followed June 25th, 1950. And then as I got to know Korean families and Korean people better, I heard about uh, families who had very tragic story. Uh, mothers who were separated from their children. Uh, uh, they intentionally, uh, they were from North Korea, they were refugees, they intentionally did not bring down their children, thinking that the separation would be temporary and the South Korean and American and UN forces would come back and, and, and liberate their, their North Korea again, but that didn't happen. And so they were tragically separated from their family members. And then I was back again as U.S. ambassador, uh, actually at the time of the 60th anniversary of the Korean War. And, you know, I recall at that time how moving it was to see the way the, um, the South Korean government uh, invited back uh, veterans uh, who had fought in Korea under, under a U.N. flag uh, from not only the United States, but from the other participating countries. And to see those veterans come back, many of whom had not been back, most of whom had not been back, of course, since the early 1950s, to see what Korea uh, had become, what the Republic of Korea had done, and the, and the appreciation that the people of the Republic of Korea felt for uh, the sacrifices that had been made. Organized a group of uh, Korean, South Korean uh, university students, uh, all of whom had been born in the, uh, you know, decades after the Korean War, uh, to uh, take a bicycle ride. And we, we, we had a route that went along what was known as the Nakdong perimeter, some of the darkest days of the Korean War, and uh, there were many dark days, but uh, uh, right after uh, June 25th, when in the months of uh, August and September, uh, in those terrible hot monsoon months, uh, they were defending uh, the, uh, the last remaining ground held by UN forces in the Republic of Korea, and that was the so-called Pusan perimeter around the uh, Nakdong River. And, you know, as we, as we biked with these students, many of them said to me, you know, my grandfather used to, you know, talk about the Korean War, but I never listened. And now, I, now I'm, 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 I'm doing this bike ride to learn and to, and to, uh, to, to honor uh, his and, 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 and my grandparents' memories. So that was quite a, a memorable way of, of thinking again about some of the things we're trying to think about this year. Seems like a lot of these veterans entrust in you to be the, the receptacle, to be the storyteller, to carry on their memory. So that, that must be a, a really special feeling for you. Um, I... <laughs> I just, honestly, I consider myself even to this day, yes, a, a storyteller, but a messenger. I went to visit the veterans to convey the gratitude of the Korean people, right, first and foremost, because if I weren't, if it weren't for them, uh, uh, here's the Italian veteran, hey, <laughs> uh, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be here, nor would any of my family or any Koreans. And that is why I call them my grandpas, because I think I it, literally if it weren't for them, I wouldn't be here. Um, but now that I've been, uh, I've visited them and conveyed that message, um, I am bringing back a message from them, from the veterans themselves to all of us, the younger generation that, um, you know, we cannot forget. I mean, it's so easy now because warfare has evolved. And, and the more virtual, you know, world that we're living in, you know, it, it's, it's just maybe more difficult to grasp. However, um, the sacrifices they made are real. And I just hope that um, people will take some time to reflect on it. And um, you don't have to go far like I did. You know, there are people, I guarantee you, there are people around your city, near your city where you live, um, who fought and died for us. I also have a neighbor uh, in, a, in the cemetery that is next door to me on this lovely Montana lake where I have a little cabin. And so my sort of, my 
uh, tribute, I guess, to, to the Korean War this year is to remember the memory of a, uh, of a young man who died on July 30th, 1950, just after he turned 20 years old. Uh, he didn't make it to the Nakdong perimeter. He was among the first U.S. forces who were sent to Korea, uh, uh, ill-equipped, ill-prepared, uh, overwhelmed uh, by uh, superior forces coming uh, from the north, and he lost his life there. Uh, and I think it's the kind of, of death that was commemorated in, in songs I remember from my youth, I mean, of the Vietnam era by people like John Prine, who wrote a song in which there's a called Hello in there, in which there's a, a lyric that says, we lost Davy in the Korean War, still don't know what for, don't matter anymore. <laughs> um, you know, that's been in my head, one, because we've lost John Prine now uh, in our latest crisis, but, um, but that's been in my head because when I see this, uh, this grave of this, this young man who uh, lived to be barely 20 and died in a country he did not know of, Korea, in 1950, and now buried in this lovely and quiet cemetery on, a, on the lakes of, of Milner, um, I think we do know what for now. Uh, I think we do know what for. And uh, we honor those sacrifices, but we also, I think, have to commit ourselves to the unfinished business on the Korean Peninsula and in the world uh, and uh, the challenges we face today. And I, I do feel like the significance of all that's happened over these last decades and all that happened 70 years ago is that uh, the United States and the Republic of Korea have, have, have formed the kind of alliance of values that uh, of shared sacrifice that I hope will underpin our efforts to reshape the world again in a way that's true to those values, that's true to the sacrifice, and, uh, and ensures that uh, the next generations uh, will also uh, appreciate and honor uh, all that's gone before. But one of the interesting stories is that Koreans have sent American Korean War veterans masks, masks to help fight the scourge around COVID. And I think that's particularly moving. And I, I have one here today that was provided to me by the area commander. And it shows that all these years on, Koreans haven't forgotten those who served on the peninsula and that they want to protect their lives 70 years on. So thank you. Thank you to those who provide, to those who care. And thank you to our Korean War veterans in the United States in Korea, and in all the United Nations supporting countries. So we have a debt of gratitude to pay still to those war veterans of the Korean War. Those who said that this is as far as communism is going to go in Asia. And those who pushed them back and caused a new line to be formed. Now the military demarcation line that is the center point of the demilitarized zone. Still one of the most heavily armed lines separating two countries anywhere in the world, still requiring presence, still requiring shared danger, hardship, and courage. And so it's been my honor to be a part of that. As we think about this day today, the 25th of June, 2020, let's never forget those who were not forgotten but who indeed did sacrifice so that freedom would have another day and another day and another day and another decade and another extended period of time where it could be successful. And that's where we find ourselves today. I thank God for those who stood the line back in those days. I honor them. I remember them. I'm privileged to have met so many of them during my different tours in Korea and elsewhere. They're just humble individuals in every case. And they're people who made history by simply doing their duty every day to the best of their abilities. What an example they were and are. And what a group that we must remember. So let's never forget them. It is a war that cannot and should not be forgotten. 